I'm an Albanian American. Um, there's a lot of me that's Albanian. There's a, all of me that's American. Albanians were part of a tribe called the Illyrians, uh, 18 tribes of what used to be all of Europe, and now are dwindled down to what is known today as Kosovo, Macedonia, portions of Montenegro, and Albania as a country in itself. Um, so we've become a, a small group of people. At one point, we used to be a very large group of people. And part of that is because each time a new, a new era came in, a new ruling force came in, uh, a lot of the Albanians were assimilated into those other cultures and lost their own. So our parents knew that historically Albanians can very easily lose that which they come from. So they worked very hard to maintain that. But at the same time, if you understand your culture in that way, you also understand that if you work hard to maintain your culture and, and your ethnic backgrounds, you can assimilate into a, a new culture. You can become part of something different. My name is Type Redzevic, and I was born in what used to be the former Yugoslavia, in a portion called Montenegro, which is the Black Mountains. Um, now it's actually an independent country. At about the age of four, we left Montenegro and decided to come to the United States. Uh, my father's idea was that coming to America would provide a lot of opportunities for us. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, in the Kensington section of Brooklyn. My dad actually, he's um, one of four brothers, and he was the first to say, I need something more for myself. Um, back in Montenegro, they didn't have much, and he he knew that he needed to flee and he said I've got to try something new I want to make sure that my um, kids um, have more freedom than I do here so he came across and he said to his dad I spoke to my grandpa about this and he, he said to his dad if I succeed in America you all will succeed in America my name is Celia Redzvik and I'm 12 years old I'm turning 13 in August and I was born here in Staten Island and I've grown up here I'm going to go to Mirage Islamic School for high school and uh, I'm going to be the first, one of the first class, you know, to graduate into high school. Um, when, when the Albanian community decided to buy the property where the mosque is located at this time and where the Mirage Islamic School is located, I had gotten involved with my wife and myself. I was a teacher at that time, so I had time off during the summer. I decided to help them, voluntary, and for several months I worked there. When we started that project, I never would have imagined that my daughter would be attending a school there one day. I assumed it was going to become something very simple, a mosque or a community center where people can go every once in a while. And then you find out that, you know, years later, my daughter is at that school. My wife is now teaching. My daughter has now graduated the eighth grade from that school. So as a community, the Albanians have come together, purchased that property, built that structure, and now have provided my daughter with an education. And that's going to continue because, as we said earlier, she's been accepted to many other schools that are public schools and even private schools we could afford to send her to. She just doesn't want to go anywhere else. My name is Vulkarnein Vardar. I'm Imam and the President of Albanian Islamic Cultural Center. And I born in Macedonia. People from here, they invite me to come here. And uh, we start to know each other more and better and they love me and I love them and they said after you finish in college please you can come here and we can work together here and I was thinking we have to do something better for the community to save them and to educate their children our people to be more helpful for themselves and to others and we start in 1990 and we bought this land. It cost around $475,000. And we start to go house by house to ask them to give us money. And we collect this money for three months. And we bought this land and start to build in 1992, the new building. And we opened the mosque in 1995. In 1999, we opened the school with three grade, PDK, kindergarten and first grade, with five students, five children. Three of them was my kids. And every year we add one class. 
Now we are in eighth grade, alhamdulillah. Next year in 2007-2008, we'll open the high school. Now we have 220 students. The best thing about the school is how the teachers treat us and, um, and how you make friends and they also care about you here in the school. I like that the teachers are very caring when you're sick or anything. Um, they care about you a lot and they might even call home to make sure you're okay. They're really caring, like the teachers they care I like a lot. It has high ac academics and it brings your religion into it so you don't only l learn the knowledge of um, like where you can learn math and English but you can learn the knowledge of your religion so it's equal balance between like it says in the Quran a ha one hour for yourself and hour for religion. I believe that every single teacher whether it's a male or a female in the school is a role model for my students and all my teachers, with no ex exceptions, are highly educated and they've already either worked in the school or outside in the outside world with different, ca different careers or as teachers. And being just a role model for the students, it shows them that we value education. We put so much stress on academics so that they would have the same feeling like us, that we do value education and we want them the best in the market or as they say, the top of the cream. We have a lot of parents that come in here and we speak Albanian to them, you know, and um, we just know everything that's going on in the Albanian community because of the mosque. You know, they send mail, you know, letters home to us in the mail, you know, telling us everything that's happening in the community. And this is the mosque where we pray and we have like 14, like 14,500 square feet in this place. And in one shot, they can pray like 2,500 people. Mark Shkreli, and I am the director of Mother Teresa Center of Our Lady of Shkodra Church in Hartsdale, New York. Mother Teresa Center was uh, uh, started in 1999, the church, when we started our new church in Hartsdale. And uh, we named the church after Shkodra, which is one of the main cities in uh, Albania. Uh, then we decided that our center should be named after Mother Teresa. I mean, the whole world was uh, using Mother Teresa and she was Albanian, why not us using it? <laughs> and uh, uh, the beauty of this day is that uh, all these organized by the church, everybody shows up, Muslim, Orthodox, Catholic, uh, regardless of religion. And really nobody knows here who is what religion, we are just Albanian. When you're in America, you, you, you know, you, you, you kind of forget a lot of things as far as like coming from other countries. But with Albanians, you know, we know who we are and we know that um, we can never forget where we came from. I try to come you know, all the time when they have them. And uh, I like to support, you know, my community and uh, just, you know, I'm, because I'm a role model to some of the kids and I, I love it. Every single stop that means something is like a history. In a war before when they fighting, this one they call Chefin, they put the people anywhere where is the war, where he died, they just cover with this and they put in the ground. That's why they carry this. The dance, fight, 
that means like a fight, how they fight in with the soldiers before and they little by little they turn to the tradition dancing how they did and so. That's why we try to keep it in life so much we can. We can make 100% but at least closer 95% to not forget us tradition, culture. The way they dance, like I think the dances that they do are like amazing. Events like this, you know, we're Wedding. allowed to we're yeah. allowed to showcase our culture and our heritage and everything. So events like this should definitely be kept. <laughs> The weddings that we throw, which um, are still the culture and the uh, traditions are still found across the United States. Um, it's quite elaborate, but it's also quite a spectacle. Uh, there's, we, we dress up in a certain attire, and you'll, you'll notice us coming down in, as a group down the street as we're coming towards the bride's house and singing songs and, and just uh, expressing a lot of joy <laughs> and dancing in the streets. So a lot of the times uh, um, people will say to me, oh, you're Albanian, did you get married the same way my friend down the block got married? Wow, what an event. We thought it was like the 4th of July or something. So uh, that, that still goes on. I'm very surprised, but it still goes on even among the younger generations. Even though I was born in the United States, born and raised in the United States, I always felt that um, it was the proper way to have an arranged marriage. My mom and my dad had selected my husband and we got to know each other. And we, we've been married <coughs> ever since for the past 18 years now. And that's pretty much it. Our, our wedding was uh, unlike most weddings because usually in an Albanian wedding or in an Albanian wedding or at least back then uh, the bride and still today you'll find this to be the case the bride really didn't get to enjoy her wedding as much she was um, standing uh, like a statue and just being the center of attention with the groom in the one location but today that's that's changed a lot of brides and grooms are out there dancing having fun just like your typical American wedding I can tell you very honestly very often I, I think that my parents love my wife more than they love me and I've seen my wife when we used to have a garden out here she'd be out here with my father planting cucumbers and peppers and flowers and trees and everything and I haven't uh, ever heard my parents say one negative thing about my wife mm -hmm. which is very unique and, and very different and unfortunately that's actually changing and as my wife said earlier the, the idea of our marriage is not that she and I are only invested in it, but it's both of our families completely invested. Mm -hmm. And now it's changing, it's becoming more of, well, does he like her, does she like him? Have they chosen each other? And that's all that's important. And so it makes it much easier, if there is a problem, for those two people to part ways. My father-in-law takes care of um, everything around on the outside of the home. The fruit trees, as you saw, he takes care of the garbage, the shopping. Um, on the weekends, we'll shop, but throughout the course of the day, if there's anything we need, milk or bread, butter, anything, he just um, steps out and, and brings that home. My mother-in-law is uh, the cook in our house. She's always cooking. I know I, I prepared a meal for you, but if you tasted hers, it would be a hundred times better than what I served here today. When I was small, my grandparents raised me while my parents were working. So I think we're really close. And you know, when they go to Europe, I always miss them. And, you know, I, I love seeing them every day. We would not have been able to complete our college degrees or even get started with our careers if it hadn't been for them. Um, I remember giving birth to her and then 
four months later getting back into the workforce. So my mother-in-law really did raise her. It's only been the past two, three years that we've spent a, a great deal of time together here at home and I can do more of the motherly duties here at home because um, in the past she's been their child more than ours. We have, we've never really spent that much time together. He's always working, I was always working and now we're just enjoying every moment of it. So we, we owe a, a great deal of gratitude and um, thanks to my mother-in-law and my father-in-law. I think, I'm sorry, I think a lot of that helped us in other ways too because Salia would be able to speak Albanian and English so she was bilingual from an early age because my mother and father would speak to her in Albanian only and we would speak to her in English so she picked up both languages and knows both languages equally as well. Well we've got, both of us have got cousins right down the block. My brother-in-law, my husband's brother is right down this block here so we, um, in Staten Island, we can't go that far without coming across an Albanian home. So there's definitely, they're scattered throughout. And, and also, um, next door here, they're Irish, across the street that way, they're, they're Italian. We have a new family that just moved in across the street, they happen to be Turkish. Um, we have an older couple, which is now just, she's alone, but they were Italian. And one of our neighbors, last summer, um, became very protective of our, our pear tree. He was um, always keeping an eye on it, making sure that people weren't pulling or tugging at it the wrong way so as not to break a branch. And each time we'd come back from uh, Montenegro, he'd tell me that I gave so-and-so pe pears or I gave this one peaches. And I just, I, the fact that he took ownership during that period we were away just made me feel good. I feel like I can uh, rely on my neighbors here. And that's a very, very uh, wonderful feeling. We consider it uh, a good thing to do, you plant near the, the fence line or the road line because travelers, passerbyers, should be able to stop and have an apple from your tree or a pear from your tree or a cherry from your tree or a bit of grapes from your grapevine and that's been culturally something that's been put into us and taught by our parents and our grandparents that whatever it is that you have in order for it to become halal, in order for it to become more abundant, you need to share with people. You can't have just for yourself. If, um, our peaches come in or our apples come in, my wife bags them and drops them off at the neighbors so the neighbors get a chance to taste a little something. This is a grapevine and um, there's little grapes coming out now. And then my mom, she likes plants, so she just plants a whole lot over here. And then further down, we have strawberries over here, and they're actually really good. And this is just more plants. And there's another grapevine over here. There's a lot of them actually <laughs> everywhere. And then this is like some more, this is some type of mint from Europe over there, and some roses, and then more plants and trees and bushes and this is also like um, a nectarine tree, and this is also a nectarine tree. That tree right there is a pear tree, and then over here we have what we call vichnia, and they're like sour cherries, almost like cranberries, and then another grapevine. And in my dog's pen there, there's a plum tree. And then there's more peach trees on the other side and fig trees. That one's a fig tree. And they're all really good when they come out during the summer. And he's seven in human years, so he's um, 70. Actually, he's 10 in human years, so he's 70 in dog years. And, you know, he came, like we got him when he was a little puppy and we just grew up together. Now, I love him it's a lot. And he's the best. And I don't want you to think that the grill is dirty. I leave it like this on purpose so that this way it's seasoned all the time. Whenever you want something quick but very tasty, the barbecue is your best bet. Within 10 minutes you have a meal and anybody and everybody can watch and they can see how it's prepared. Yeah. He does the grilling outdoors <laughs> and I do it indoors. Today I'm going to make for you an authentic Albanian dish known as grosh. And we begin by letting beans soak overnight. 
This is known as smoked beef, a very popular Albanian food. In the meantime, I'm going to take this, um, the beans that I've washed, put them in this huge pot, half an onion, and two tomatoes to give it flavor. Fill it up with water and let it sit for three, four hours. You want to keep a, a medium flame, not too high. Here we have yeprak, um, the grapevine that you see outside. I've pulled about 50 leaves. I've soaked them, drenched them in hot water, and I ended up making a special um, herb uh, filling for them. We have something known as pita. And you would always find pita in an Albanian household. You have in here um, spinach, you have sour cream, and the dough we knead ourselves and we put it together so it's very, it's very popular amongst many Albanians. It it's time consuming as is the other dishes, but once you um, sit down and eat them, they're worth the time. Over here, we have um, another very popular Albanian dish known as bukkala mochit. In English, you would just refer to this as cornbread. But we've basically just added eggs and milk and flour. And there we have our, our um, cornmeal bread. The moment we got home from school, we would eat with my mom, and then an hour later, she was off on a train heading to the city. She uh, had gotten into the cleaning business. They didn't know how to speak the language. My father ended up driving a taxi, so while he didn't speak the language, he knew every single street in New York City. They did something that most Albanians did back then, which was they locked their children in, their, in the houses. They didn't have babysitters at the time, so we had to discipline ourselves. Um, my father always felt that it was important that we keep a connection between the United States and Montenegro. So uh, my first trip was when I was eight years old. Four years after we had been here in the United States, my father was able to save enough money to take us all back as a family, and we stayed one summer for one month. And it was kind of odd because my father's a farmer, so he comes from a, a farm area. So we went on the farm. So we got back to the idea of seeing goats and sheep and cow and horses and things like this. So for an eight-year-old, being in the country was really exciting. We stayed for a month. Then about two years later, uh, my father decided time to go again. We went back again, but at this time I was 10. I was a little bit older. So at that point, I started riding the horses and milking the cows and you know feeding the cows and doing a lot of different things. So it really became interesting. So we, we had an opportunity to see that Montenegro was a great place. It was a beautiful place. So as we got older, even if my parents didn't visit the summers, my brother and I would save our money and we would go ourselves. And my father always tells me stories about why he loved Albania. My mom, she didn't really go there when she was a kid, but now that we go more often, she loves it too. Both husband and wife need to keep a job or sometimes two jobs each so their children are being raised um, without parents. Being an American to me means that you need to work and provide and you need to give back to the community, you need to give back to those that are in need. 